We'd like to welcome you today to the Extension Disaster Education Network webinar for this month. Um, I am Scott Cotton with Eden and the University of Wyoming. It's my privilege today to introduce our speaker for Keeping Animals Healthy. Our speaker today is Dr. Susan Kerr, who is a veterinarian and a regional livestock and dairy extension specialist with Washington State University. I've had the opportunity to work with Dr. Kerr and I've always found it to be very fascinating. She's been with WSU Extension for 21 years and she shared some trivia that said she's operated a nonprofit cat feedlot since she was 10 years old. I'm dying to ask more questions about that, but I'll leave it for another time. Um, it's, a so joke. it's a joke. <laughs> She will be. She will not be uh, sharing her uh, video since she at the moment doesn't have one. So please feel free to ask questions after the program or type them into the chat, and I will feed them to Dr. Kerr. Dr. Kerr, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, and hello, everyone. Oh, this is fun. Trying to advance the slides. Why are they not advancing? May either try your keyboard. Uh, so if you'll yeah go back and now. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, does anyone else see a big gray screen blocking mm, the way? No, I'm seeing. Looks it, it looks okay to me, Susan. Okay, I'm seeing. Um, okay, now we're good. All right, <laughs> let's get going here. Sorry, everybody. Okay, we're ready to start out with our first poll question. Can you drop that in, Mark? I am. It is being launched now, and you okay. may not see it, or you may or may not see it on your end, but our attendees are seeing it. Okay, I'm not seeing it. Okay, yeah, I think as a panelist, you won't see it, but our, our right. attendees are seeing it. Okay. And, and I, I can share, share the results uh, okay. when they're done, if you, if you like. Sure. We need to move along, but um, the poll questions keep things fun and interesting, I think. What were the majority answer for that one? And can you see the poll sharing now or, I, or not? I can't. I can't okay, see. Okay, so we had 58% uh, said priceless. And, oh, good. And uh, the other 33% said a pound of cure. <laughs> All right, great. Um, I re as a veterinarian, I really think prevention is priceless. It was always difficult in practice to see uh, in injuries and illnesses in animals that could have been prevented with, with just a little bit of care and forethought. So um, I find it priceless. And just as a livestock um, owner yourself or those that advise livestock owners, let's put the emphasis on prevention. And all these bullet items that are listed here, I think you've done 99.9% .9 of the work of keeping animals healthy if you do these and probably 75% if you do the first two bullets to involve a veterinarian um, at critical points and, and just regularly in your livestock care and production and in sourcing your animals from reputable sources is very important, N not from auction yards or, or uh, dubious places on Craigslist. Um, and I put disease free in quotes because with some animals we, we can kind of certify that they don't have a certain disease and others we can only say they don't have evidence of this disease now. And as always, it's more important to look at the total herd information instead of information from one individual animal. Uh, knowing that one goat is, is CAE, it's a contagious virus, CAE free is not as important as knowing the status of the entire herd. And all those other things really are common sense, but we sometimes ignore them. I tell you that um, really good nutrition for all of us makes us resilient and much more able to resist diseases or even be more resilient when it comes to parasites. And we can't also uh, overestimate or overemphasize the, the need for good farm sanitation. If there's one thing people can do to help reduce um, the spread of disease in the herd, it would be if they do have a herd addition, not only uh, doing pre-purchase uh, laboratory testing and examination, but it's isolating that animal on the new farm. Put them in quarantine for one to three months if you can. If they're going to have a, a break with a disease they've been harboring, let them do that in isolation instead of uh, just buying them and putting them right in with your the rest of your herd. Stress is a 
is a big source of problems in animals and with people, and these are just some sources of stress for animals, and, and we can have a role in reducing these. We can uh, work on not overcrowding our animals. Many of the farms I see um, have, have problems because I call them underlanded. They have too many animals for the amount of property they have, and then they just suffer the consequences of that, and we need to be more proactive about having appropriate number of animals for those facilities. Uh, predators can be very stressful for animals if they're constantly have this fear of being preyed on and, and we need to address that and and uh, poor ventilation and ammonia fumes uh, easily set animals up for pneumonia. Um, introduction of new animals is very stressful for especially for the social breeds like uh, goats and pigs and, and really dampness and being chilled is, is very stressful as well so we need to provide good shelter and, and uh, and don't forget shelter from heat stress as well. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in this presentation talking about biosecurity and they're really just management practices uh, that help prevent or spread the diseases on your farm. And we should care not only because uh, um, healthy animals are more profitable, but keeping them healthy reduces suffering and it certainly addresses animal welfare. You'll find throughout this talk that I'm quite risk adverse when it comes to animals. I, I generally err on the, always err on the side of, of what is less risky for the animal. And you might find that your value is different from that and, and that's fine, but my bias will come out many times. And, and it's um, generally when we talk about risks versus benefits, to have lower risk generally means more actions, more management actions on our part. And that's a decision to make. Are you willing to do the added number of management tasks that it takes to lower your risk? And some of you might be willing to do them all and others very few, but just realize your livestock will be at greater risk. There are levels of biosecurity um, practices for different levels of risk. If, for example, if you are um, going to a lot of shows or sales with your animals, fairs and so on, risk is higher. And if you have people coming onto your property with animals of the same species, or they've even just raised those animals, you're at increased uh, risk. If you have a closed herd with no visitors, your biosecurity risk level is quite low, but there's still basic practices to do. And one of the, um, one of the resources listed at the end specifically has recommendations based on biosecurity risk levels for increasing level of management tasks for your increasing risk level. If you have a naive flock or herd, meaning it's it's just been home raised and it's a, a, it's a, a naive flock or herd with a little exposure to other animals, they're at fairly high risk if other animals do come in. Uh, in and so risk level is currently low, but it would be high for them should um, should they be mixed with other animals. Also, we have local disease outbreaks. Sometimes things like avian influenza and the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, um, which we see depicted here in these photos. Um, those are going on in areas sometimes, so that affects uh, biosecurity risk levels at certain times. And the severity of the pathogen that's on the loose. Um, we have certainly the ORF or sore mouth virus is, is just ubiquitous. It's um, a known pathogen. It's of concern, but it causes, uh, rarely causes illness as opposed to avian influenza or um, PED. It doesn't cause illness to this degree. If you have international visitors, your farm is, is also at increased risk. It'd be good to um, make sure those visitors either haven't been internationally for at least a week or they, they have um, new clothing, new shoes, disinfected shoes and clothing uh, before they visit your farm. But uh, certainly, uh, no visitors within a week of international travel is safest. And all, as always, consult with your veterinarian when you have a question about your degree of biosecurity risk. Here's a, a specific case where we need to think uh, more closely about what we're doing and how we're putting animals at risk. With avian influenza, it seems that wild ducks are more tolerant of that. They can easily carry the virus and not be ill. And then they can fly to uh, small ponds and perhaps you've got some domestic ducks that could then go down to that pond and mingle with those wild ducks. Those domestic ducks can then come home, and if you've got uh, chickens intermingled with uh, 
your domestic ducks, that is a very easy way for your poultry, your your chickens, to be exposed to avian influenza, the, the high path version, because ducks, your domestic ducks intermingling with wild ducks and domestic chickens can be that bridge. And we need to think about that too when we're um, uh, housing birds at exhibits. It'd be good to have ducks and and chickens in separate buildings if possible, if not as far away from each other as possible, with no direct contact with animals or ch children going directly from the ducks to the chickens. Here are just some diseases we worry about when we're talking about uh, biosecurity and disease control. Uh, the big one, obviously, is foot and mouth disease, which we do not have in this country. We haven't for decades. But we're concerned about that because it's highly contagious affects um, all um, uh, farm livestock, food animals, and is not so much deadly as it is uh, just devastating in that all animals get sick, they all go off feed, and we, we have to, there's just this huge ripple effect through the economy of uh, no food is sold or moved and, and um, just farms come to a stop to control the disease, and there's just a huge ripple effect. Um, but we, you have these many other diseases listed here of various pathogenicity or um, and um, and importance. Ringworm and warts, you could say they aren't very important. They're very contagious, however, and they could get um, animals excluded from fairs. Um, but I do want to mention, we'll highlight PED virus, the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, or it seems to be more prevalent during the winter months, so we're coming into that. And here in the corner, we've got a, a goat showing evidence of caseous lymphadenitis, which is a contagious bacterial disease that can easily set up shop on a farm by being brought in on, a, on an animal. And you can see the lumps there that are uh, contagious abscesses, and then we have these sheep were diagnosed with Yoni's disease. That's a very contagious disease that can, um, it's a bacterial disease that can again set up shop on a premise and be contagious and it's uh, slowly fatal to these animals. Very hard to eradicate from a herd or flock in the property. But if we plan biosecurity for foot and mouth disease, we're really, really, really ready for anything and we'll um, we have good security against other these other diseases that we don't want to enter either. Diseases spread just in simple context, either directly from sick animals or carrier animals and their discharges, or indirect contact from uh, surfaces or the wind or dirt or feet or water, and and even through our hands and our boots and clothing. We have to think about um, all these means, and they're more important. Um, some with some means than others. For example, uh, rabies pretty much only spreads through direct contact. Um, it's a very um, uh, kind of a wimpy virus that easily dries out and is inactivated on surfaces or and it's not airborne generally except if you're in caves with a lot of bat dung. Uh, but generally it's direct contact just as an example. We're going to go through this, these six points here of the USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Services Biosecurity Checklist, and, and we'll go into detail on all, uh, all six of these components of their biosecurity checklist, starting with keep your distance. It's important to have um, perimeter fencing to keep your animals in and other animals out, including uh, your neighbor's animals and um, wildlife. And I think we have to get a, do a better job of restricting access to our property and animals. Most farms have a real open door policy and um, people can drive on and drive all over before anyone uh, notices. So we need some signage to restrict access and have, um, if possible, only one access for visitors. So it's clear to them where they're to enter and where they can park and where they go to next. We don't need people of, of unknown origin where they've been previous to this wandering all over the farm. Most times visitors will not need contact with the animals uh, unless they're obviously there in an animal related capacity like veterinarians or hoof trimmers. So people don't, they can see the animals and often that's happy, that's good enough for them. And uh, I really think we need to do a better job too of 
of checking out the footwear and clothing people have when they come on the premises. If you're hosting a farm tour, for example, it's very important to make that part of the criteria to participate, that people wear street shoes or uh, disinfected rubber footwear if they are wearing um, uh, barn clothing of that sort, barn footwear that it's been disinfected. And the other option is uh, some farms provide their own footwear or even um, uh, impervious booties to put over footwear. Uh, keep gates closed and locked, and that should restrict people to some extent. And there's no need for people to bring their dogs to your farms. And it's really important that everyone there on the farm and the visitors are educated about rules for that farm to um, restrict biosecurity uh, breaches. And that's a good um, sign that's listed there on that gate. You just would like to have a, a number there for people to call if they do want to come in. Say it's a pretty strict property and you're the veterinarian there to, for a, to come onto the property but the gate's locked. You just need to be able to call and somebody can unlock the gate to get, give you entrance. Continuing on our, our our uh, biosecurity protocols here will go with keep it clean is the next step. We really want to reduce the risk from um, wildlife such as, and birds and rodents and flies can easily be part of disease cycles or simply spread them on their feet. And when we're uh, working with animals, just think in your mind, you always want to go from clean to dirty situations, cleaner to dirty like maternity, pens, to um, uh, scraping manure, not the other way around. Young animals to old, old a older animals have uh, um, more disease experience and sometimes they're harboring more diseases, so we don't want to go from older animals to younger animals and then healthy to sick and, and instead of treating sick animals and then going to healthy. And you wash your hands and scrub your boots and hopefully even change clothing and coveralls in between those groups. We'll talk several times about footwear here. You can see the action in this photo involved with cleaning these boots. You can't disinfect unless you clean first. So this person is using a brush, a soapy disinfectant there, and removing visible debris along with the disinfecting process. But if you just tromp through a foot bath with, with filthy boots, the, it's a false sense of security. You think you've disinfected, and all you've done is really leave debris in the foot bath that inactivates the disinfectant chemical in there, and it hasn't worked on your boots, and you go on your merry way spreading disease. And uh, Unless you've removed the, the debris uh, and things are visibly clean, the dis disinfectant just won't work. Um, when we talk about risk, remember I said I'm risk adverse, it's to your level of satisfaction what to what degree you, you wash equipment and vehicles you move all the time. When there are avian influenza outbreaks and PED virus outbreaks, people are washing tires and washing down equipment and disinfecting them. That's the level of biosecurity we need. Uh, when those act those uh, diseases aren't active in an area, people tend to slack off and just uh, drive around and maybe they'll think about their boots and their hands, but not about their tires. Um, but, but should we get a, a huge disease outbreak of something very important, we will have these truck washing stations and uh, after the avian influenza and PD outbreaks in the Midwest, some farms, the big poultry and, and swine farms have uh, have redone their facilities, including um, truck wash-in and wash-out facilities, because it's such an important part of controlling these diseases. This is overkill. This is not what we're saying you need to do on your farms, but these are two uh, federal veterinarians that are involved in an avian influenza response, and they have Tyvek suits and, and um, rubber boots and two pairs of gloves, uh, respirators, and they're going to spray each other with this disinfectant, um, disinfect their boots, and then all of this goes into the garbage uh, that's contained and incinerated when they're done. Continuing with our keep it clean component, um, you can just read what's I've written there. I think coveralls are a great idea on farms. They, they can go over street clothes. Um, takes quite a few, depending on how many visitors you have, but maybe you can start collecting them over time. We talked about the foot bath versus a boot wash. Boot wash is much more interactive and effective. 
Um, you can see that the lower photo there, someone's using a steam jenny, which uses heat and pressure to really clean facilities really well. Uh, is that disinfected yet? No, but we can then spray it, and those facilities shown there will be uh, disinfected. Uh, meaning viruses and, and bacteria and fungi are killed. The only thing um, that could be less or left is maybe some bacterial spores. You can easily do a low-cost portable hand washing station that's depicted there. You just have a, a like a sports water jug there with um, warm water and soap and paper towels. You want that a, a being a flow of water so that the debris with people's dirty hands goes down into that wastewater bucket that you dispose of and garbage right there so um, people's hands are washed and, and everything's contained right there. Some practical everyday sanitary sanitation considerations are what we've talked about already, but I'm going to emphasize washing hands and making that convenient for you and visitors. Uh, and, and I didn't mention, though, cleaning um, water tanks and, and bunks. Uh, animals drink water several times a day, and if those get contaminated, that's a really good way for many animals to become ill. And so those uh, pay attention to, to bunks um, and, and keep them as clean as possible and, and address water safety that way. And use disinfectants wherever you can. You obviously can't disinfect uh, wooden surfaces or, or dirt or gravel. But anything that's metal or, or plastic or concrete, you really can clean and disinfect very well. Sometimes people just use the same tool dealing with food. Uh, the animals feed and with their waste materials and part of the Yoni's control um, protocol is to designate separate, um, even separate um, skid steers with bucket loaders for waste and feed. Not just hosing them out but having completely separate ones so we break that fecal oral route of contamination. And just always think about where have your feet and hands been? Those are the main ways we people are going to spread diseases around. This um, handout here is from an excellent site from Iowa State. It's the Center for Food Safety and Public Health, and I recommend you go to that site and check it out. The depth of resources is just, just amazing. And this is a nice handout they have uh, that you can post, and it's, a, it's simple, and it shows you how to effectively clean and disinfect. See, so we're going to remove all the visible debris we, can, we see, and then we're going to wash with soap and water rinse because that inactivates some detergents and allow it to dry if we can and then apply the effective disinfectant that you want based on the organisms you're trying to kill and this is so crucial and it's what people never do is allow the proper contact time with that disinfectant it, it's 10 minutes sometimes and it's not completely effective until you've let that time go by and and then you can um, rinse away the disinfectant and let the item dry. And then you've got something that's ready to go. And these are protocols very important for things like um, milk feeding equipment for calves or, or lambs. Um, th this would make something finally disinfected at the end there. Here's a little uh, experiment done that showed um, both slick-soled and waffle-soled barn boots. And the number ones in each case were not um, not treated at all. They're just dirty boots, and you can see the bacterial plate counts are um, just crazy with contamination. Rinsed with water, much better, but obviously still lots of pathogens there. So I, so you'd call that ineffective. And then number three was cleaned and disinfected. You can see on the slick sold. I don't think we've got any um, bacteria growing, but there are some some still on those waffles sold boots. Those are very hard to clean. They're safer to walk in than those slick sold ones, but you really have to be diligent to get all those crooks and crannies. And remember that um, a foot bath for, or um, boot bath for animals or people, if it's not maintained, it spreads more disease than it prevents. You, you change those out when they're visibly soiled, they're, they've got dirt or manure or debris in them, and now that disinfectant is inactivated and needs to be freshened. So one that's put out and it sits out there for months is 
more harm than good. Those of you that are uh, interested or concerned about organic production have to realize that um, both vinegar and copper sulfate that are used as disinfectants are both ineffective and unapproved. So they are, they're not considered um, disinfectants at all. They are used for other purposes, but they are not effective as disinfectants. The next step in our biosecurity um, cadre here is not hauling diseases home. And you want to, if you've been somewhere with animals or, or with your animals or seeing other animals, the safest thing is to clean and disinfect the tires and equipment before returning home. And I realize few people do that, but it's just the safest thing. Here's something that you really should do, though, is anything that's been off the farm to a fair or show or anything you're adding to your, your herd, quarantine them for one to three months after arrival. And that doesn't mean um, right next door. That means at least 30 feet away. And we hope that someone, either a designated person, only deals with that animal or, as mentioned before, you deal with the main herd first and then with this animal that's in quarantine. And you observe them for any signs of illness that they would have gotten being off the farm. And you change clothing and footwear after handling this animal. Gloves are a good idea, too. You're going to really have much lower disease risk if you have a closed herd. And I often hear people say, I have a closed herd except for a ram or except for a, when I buy a bull or buck or whatever. And that means you don't have a closed herd. You have a closed herd if herd additions are only grown on that farm. You just grow your own replacements and you use artificial insemination. When you, If you're not a closed herd and you are buying new animals in, try to purchase directly from a farm uh, where you know the disease history, you've had good healthy animals from them in the past, uh, a veterinarian says they're a, a low risk source, and you've done some testing as much as you can for the diseases of concern. But whatever you do, please don't bring animals home from sale yards or uh, livestock auctions. You don't know why they're there, you don't know what conditions they have, and if they didn't have something before they went there, they've been exposed to every disease on the planet, and they can easily bring that home. So a bargain animal at a livestock auction can be the most expensive animal you ever bought if it brings serious diseases home. And these are some of the things they can bring home. Contagious hoof diseases, pneumonia, um, those are what's shown there. And, and uh, from the top to the bottom here, this is less risky to most risky that you have a closed herd. Uh, down to you purchased animals of dubious origin. Um, that's very a very risky proposition. The next step in our biosecurity um, protocol here is from the USDA is don't borrow diseases from your neighbor, meaning don't share equipment or tools or supplies with them. Borrow the neighbor's bull. Um, uh, have their dog over to visit you a lot. Those are all potential sources of disease transmission. But if you do breach these and you do need to borrow equipment, disinfect it before and after you use it. And here's a picture of, a, of kids getting ready for a, a, a class at a fair, and you can see that um, there's some community equipment there, community brushes. Um, people probably share their soap quite a bit and even some nose-to-nose -nose contact across the fence just in a high water environment that's a good way to spread disease and you can see the manure piles actually uphill from these this um, animal washing area so there's several uh, concerns here about biosecurity but it completely normal um, picture from a fair and I think maybe we can address some of these concerns by having people not put things on the ground, not allowing nose-to-nose -nose contact of the same species, uh, disinfecting the best we can after animals are gone and before the next ones come in, and then having everyone use their own brushes and pails and so on. But we, we have to be practical. That's what a fair looks like right there. The next step of biosecurity um, protocols is to know the warning signs of disease. What are the things you would be concerned about for your animals? And a lot of people will complain, well, it's too expensive to have a veterinarian involved, but it really is uh, the cost of doing business. 
when you have animals. You just have to realize it's something you're going to experience. And having a veterinarian involved is proactive and will cost less in the long run because you can use their advice to reduce the incidence or likelihood of disease. And if animals are ill, you'll get them treated promptly. You won't have to guess about what a drug to use and wonder if it's working. You'll use the right medication, the right time, um, correctly the first way. And that's very good for the animal's welfare. They won't be ill as long. But if you're reactive, you don't have a veterinarian involved proactively and you just respond to sick animals, um, then you're, you'll experience more production losses, more animals will get sick, um, and animals will, will suffer longer. You'll lose more production or more animals to disease, and, and those animals suffer longer, and that's uh, certainly an animal welfare issue. Your veterinarian can obviously help you uh, understand the signs of disease and what you should be looking for. You can call your vet and say, I, I took my pig to the fair last week, and, and what diseases should I be looking for? What are the signs of those? So know about the diseases of concern that they might have gotten at a, a, a show or a fair or just, uh, just sporadically. And watch for uh, unusual behavior, such as they're not eating, they're just lying down all the time, they're, they're not playing like normal. And, and certainly be concerned about unexpected death. And it's so important that you assess the health of all animals daily. I remember someone called me once. He wanted to get a goat to control his property that he didn't live on. He was going to check on it every Saturday. And I told him that that was not acceptable because um, he was going to just tie the goat into different areas and it would just be a, a sitting duck for any dog or anything that went by. What if it knocked over its water the first day? It'd be without water for a week. So I said that's, that's not acceptable that you check on an animal once a week like that. And we've got up there showing um, diseases that, that pig has foot and mouth disease and um, that sheep, I think that was a sheep, has a uh, contagious um, disease of the foot, foot rot, and then malignant cantaral fever of that um, cow's eye. Well, the whole cow, obviously. And then this animal has pneumonia, which it easily could have contracted at a show or sale. And then here is sore mouth, which is unfortunately contagious to humans, so you sure would like that person to be wearing gloves doing that examination. Uh, when we're concerned about diseases, it's really good that we are monitoring temperatures twice a day after animals come home from a fair or we've purchased them recently. A spike in temperature is often the first sign that an animal is going to become ill. So monitor temperatures on new or returning animals. And just watch them for signs of nasal discharge or diarrhea especially, um, poor appetite and monitor their, their appetite, as I mentioned, and their behavior, you know, their normal behavior and um, for returning animals and how they should be reacting. And call your veterinarian if you're concerned about any of those. TPR stands for temperature, pulse, and respiration. Know what's normal for the species and for individual animals. My mother always told us if her temperature ever got to 98.6, take her to the hospital because she was on death's door. She usually ran about 95 degrees. So 98.6, which is the human average, is a raging, was a raging fever for my mom. The last component here we're going to talk about is the need to report sick animals. If you're checking them every day and monitoring their temperature and their behavior and you notice something of concern, uh, a call, uh, your veterinarian, and uh, there's, there's a number that's listed there that will take you to your regional um, USDA veterinarian if you have questions. And when in doubt, give a call. Generally, you'd start with your local veterinarian or your state veterinarian, but, but call, especially if you see things like blisters and, or vesicles or ulcers of the mouth. Uh, animals have a fever and they're limping. Uh, and those are some signs of, of some diseases we really care about, so we need to notice those. And and I know people get concerned about uh, things like, they might be concerned that their bird has uh, has um, Newcastle disease or avian influenza or others that are going to mean the destruction of that animal. 
but it's so important that people realize they shouldn't hide these animals or delay them because it will be the same result for your animals. It really will. But you'll have many, many others um, that have have to be euthanized as well to contain the disease. So the first animal gets detected, we want that detected as quickly as possible so the area of containment and surveillance can be minimal and, and really really can't stress that enough. If you see diseases of concern, call your veterinarian right away to present to um, uh, for advice. And I think we have, this is actually our second poll question, even though it says third. Okay, I am launching. Thank you. Launching that now. And I'll sort of watch for, watch as our attendees uh, participate, and then I'll, I'll okay. end it. I'll end it at the right time. And we are halfway through our presentation, too. And just, just so, you, since you can't see it, uh, the question is, if, if you see signs of illness in your animal, it could be related to a foreign animal disease, whom would you call? And you've got vet, uh, your, your vet, your regional state field vet, uh, your state vet, your regional USDA, uh, APHIS vet, and then Ghostbusters. And I think the, the correct answer for any uh, who who are you going to call question is, is Ghostbusters. But this is, right. The correct answer here is all of the above except Ghostbusters. So we've got, uh, we'll give folks another few seconds. I, I end okay. Up. Possibly, okay. possibly if your Ghostbuster is a vet, you'd be all right. Right. And I just gave him the answer anyways. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to. Okay, so yeah. So I think we had 91% <laughs> said your vet, your, your vet, and then I think there were one that said the, the, the state vet. Yep. Any, anything other than Ghostbusters was correct. <laughs> all right. Um, when you, if you let people onto your farm for educational purposes or, or just entertainment or visiting neighborliness, it's really important to keep them safe too. And we've all seen this photo a million times and it makes you laugh initially and then it's just so disturbing. Um, people, pigs and chickens are just, we all have an influenza virus and we're just very concerned that these viruses are gonna, gonna mix and mingle and we'll have a, this influenza bug that's easily transmissible uh, between humans. That's our real fear because we're so social, we're around people, each other, and the regular human influenza every year is bad enough, but if we get uh, a really powerful one uh, that's easily transmissible from person to person, um, that is a huge concern. And we're concerned, again, about this close contact between people and pigs and, and chickens because this uh, gene swapping can go on in those viruses. So let's, I want to put a big um, red circle with an X over that because uh, that child and that pig should not know each other so well. There's no reason visitors need to go to the high risk areas on your farms, near lagoons, manure storage pits, or in, around bulls or, or other uh, intact males. And Strollers or wheelchairs on farms are going to pick up dirt and manure, and then those go inside homes and leave uh, debris, excuse me, <coughs> debris and manure and dirt on uh, carpets where, where infants can certainly contact them on their hands and then put their hands in their mouth. So no strollers or wheelchairs are generally allowed in, in livestock areas as a safety precaution. And, and um, just as another safety precaution, know where your farm dogs are for, to prevent bites. And then visitors wash. They might not want to wash their hands, but they've touched fences. They've tied their shoes. Just who knows what. And just insist that they ha hand wash before they um, eat or leave the premises and, and um, improve their sanitation uh, proactively yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. If, if those people don't do that. And you can even give them garbage bags for booties if you had them wear them or their footwear before they go home. And just as a little um, summary here, we're going to use protective clothing, uh, source our animals from as reputable sources as we can, control uh, vermin and, and, and flies and things that spread disease. It's important to keep animals segregated by age groups after they wean because, as I mentioned, older animals can spread diseases to younger animals more easily. If you have poor doing animals, it's best to figure out why they're poor doing and and address what the problem is. Don't hold them back. 
to be um, grouped with uh, younger animals that are the same size as this older but small animal. Find out why that animal is not doing well and address it. It can easily be a chronically infected animal that's going to infect that next um, group. And again, I'm risk adverse, so avoid taking animals to shows and sales and fairs. But some of you say, forget it. Uh, I love going to fairs with my animals. It's a big part of my kid's life. And that's just that level of risk you're willing to accept. And you just have to realize your biosecurity risk is elevated. If things die that you're, and you don't know why, it's important to find out why. So necropsy those, and then you can compost the mortalities on your property. Don't just leave them um, lying around. We talked about all these other things, and um, using artificial insemination is also another um, step towards increased biosecurity. You don't have that male animal there on the property as a source of infection. And this is our third poll question, but. Okay, and I am launching it. Now. Calling it second. Yeah, this one is, it says, I have livestock and take, take them to fairs and shows, and simple yes, no. Yep, should be very quick. Okay, what kind of answers are you seeing? So we've got about eight, eight of 17 have responded, and uh, I've got five yes and three no. Okay, we'll just move on. Um, just realize that uh, if you do go to a fair or show, it really affects your farm biosecurity risk level. If you do go to a fair, it's important that you keep it bef keep things clean before, during, and after the fair. And you can see on this timeline from a month up to the day of the fair, you can you should disinfect equipment and your trailer, um, booster animals. They've hopefully been vaccinated well in advance, but now you're boostering them for relevant diseases and underpin their health with proper nutrition. Day one to seven, we're going to be at a week long fair. Don't share equipment with others and cover your feed so flies aren't buzzing all around and depositing E. coli on it, for example. Wash your hands uh, repeatedly and for your own health and for your animals. And try to avoid that direct public animal contact like that little child had with the pig. Now you're taking the animals home and from day one of being home up to a month later, immediately uh, disinfect your equipment in the trailer. Isolate the animals that went for at least three weeks. I, I like one to even three months. And you're going to check their temperature daily and monitor them and, and do their chores last, as mentioned previously. During the fair, anything you can do to reduce direct contact between uh, animals of similar species is important. Uh, so are things like what is the prevailing wind direction and, and um do do animals have nose to nose contact? One thing that's nice about the stalls shown here is those are metal, and they can easily be um, nearly nearly sterilized. They can be disinfected to being extremely clean. Uh, what I recommend to people if they can is to try to if there's room to buy up some extra stalls and just keep them vacant between animals of different origins. It's not always possible. So you could maybe put animals that are market animals next to each other as opposed to breeding stock. And how do you address risk uh, in your common areas? Um, you can take along, you, you can use gloves. I've seen people do that and um, spraying down areas where they're going to be where other animals have been before. Um, anything your animal might contact that others have. Spraying them down with disinfectant. And limiting the spread of disease by indirect contact. Remember our feet and our hands to disinfect those. Wash and disinfect as often as you can. And here's someone spraying down, um, I think, spraying down um, the equipment here that his animals are on um, to help prevent things like club lamb, fungus, or sore mouth or something like that. That's indirect contact. Here's just a, a really critical thing, though, is quarantining any animals you buy or anything you've been at with a fair, uh, like a, a jackpot steer. That is just a mixing pot of all kinds of potential diseases when you take an animal to fair, to fair, to fair. Uh, again, isolate for at least 21 days, 30, 30 feet from other animals. You can think of 30, 30, 30 days, 30 feet. 
you're monitoring them. We've we've gone someone else. Uh, we've gone sorry. We've gone through all these things, and but do know the signs of uh, disease that you're concerned about. Here's that sore mouth photo again. So be monitoring those animals for the signs of of sore mouth that you're concerned about. This is some interesting statistics from the uh, National um, uh, Animal Plant Health Inspection Services study done in 2011, where they asked small scale livestock and poultry operators, how often do you quarantine animals that are either new to the farm or returning from being off the farm? And you can see that well over 50% only sometimes or rarely or never quarantine. We only have 40% that always do that. Oops, I think, there we go. And then if they, when they say why they didn't, the main thing they say is they trust the source of the animals or the place from which the animals are returning. Um, and um, you can't see viruses, you can't see bacteria, you can, you can trust them, but they can still be of certainly high risk. Several of them say they don't have, though, um, space to do it, uh, and I think it's a priority and it's something you should just plan and, and find a way to make that work on your facility. Work with your veterinarian to establish uh, a protocol for your bios biosecurity protocol for your farm or flock. and. Um, that's the most um, effective way to have a program that works for your property. Establishing your farm biosecurity plan, as I mentioned, work with your vet. Here's some links to things that can help you. And in your plan, be sure to address all these bulleted items here. Where, to, how to, where are people going to walk? It's traffic. We don't want them walking where animals eat. We don't want them walking through high manure areas and then into animals where, places where there's baby animals. How we're going to quarantine animals or isolate them uh, and then how will we deal with all those other factors. And something you might think about is a lot of people have uh, aerial photos for their farm, their premise, and you can look at those or you can just draw a diagram yourself and then, that, and then look at, well, how does traffic flow? Where could we stop? Um, visitors and have just one entrance for them. Where could we put up a gate? You can see this farm has access from multiple places and, and we really want to control all that driving around. We want to have, if possible, a, um, a paved area where visitors park and we can, uh, we can uh, clean that area quite well if it's paved. Where does the um, person delivering feed come and how can we prevent him from driving on our property, delivering feed, and then having to do this big circle around the whole property to turn around. Just just think about the traffic flow, and you can see number four there is where um, there's mortality composting. We want that well off site, downwind, downstream from the farm. Just Just look at the big picture for biosecurity on your farm, literally. And this title of this talk was Keeping Animals Healthy. So we need to talk about uh, other aspects as well, which, which include all the things that are, that are shown there, um, the vaccination program, including boosters. For many diseases, if you're not going to booster, you might as well not even give the first vaccination. It's wasted money. Um, parasite control. I didn't say treatment. It's control. Um, animals have parasites, and it's important to learn how to keep them under control, and, but yet not develop uh, dewormer resistance due to overuse. Very important, even in organic farming situations, when animals are ill, we treat them. And treat them with an effective medication, working with your veterinarian. And if that animal has to come out of the organic system, then so be it. But we're ethically obligated to treat that animal. And all these other things that we mentioned are just essential parts of animal care, especially frequent observation. Regarding vaccinations, you have to work with your veterinarian because so many diseases are local. So I've listed just some vaccinations that might be needed for the different species. Uh, but these could easily um, be expanded uh, depending on the risks in your area. Uh, E-Extension has many previous webinars on biosecurity or disease control, and they're listed here. And these are all archived and available for free downloading. And here's some additional resources, and I just can't stress the value of that uh, Iowa State resource enough. But we have many valuable um, biosecurity planning uh, documents on the e-extension pages as well. 
and I believe that was our last slide and now we ask you to do a survey if you would there's a link in the chat box can you all see that if you can please click on that we're going to give you some time now to complete that survey yes um, I just uh, posted that to the chat pod it will take you about three minutes um, I see that I've got an extra um, I've got a space there's not a space in there that should be so um, you might have to copy and paste that into, thank you, Jerry, um, to the, uh, actually, she sent that to me instead of everybody. I think it's okay. I was able to click on it from, from okay. chat. So well, good enough. I think good it enough. should, uh, browser will take care of it. I'm going to put a link also to um, learn. That link I just put in is uh, all the biosecurity uh, yeah, links sure. inside learn.extension.org for, for folks. Thank you. Great, great, great. All right, so so we'll give everybody just a, a couple of minutes to complete that um, survey, and then we'll come back for questions. So as you are finishing your survey and you think of questions, you can either add them in the chat pod or into the Q and A. Is that correct, Mark? That that is correct. Uh, our preference would be in Q and A. If you if you ask them there, it's a little easier for us to see when they've been asked, and also mark them okay. as uh, answered. But if you have any issues with Q Q and A, you can also uh, ask in chat. Mm -hmm. And will we know the the link to where this recording will be housed? Yes, ma'am. We certainly will. This recording will be accessible from the from today's learn event. Um, and so give me half a second and I will repost that into our chat pod. Thanks. People might need that if they want to go and look at some of those references. Yeah. We also will have it listed on a slide just in a little bit later on. Um, actually, um, if you look at the bottom of the slide we're currently looking at, that um, a, a URL is listed there. Now, it will take us a, a little bit of time to get there, so don't look for it three minutes after we finish this webinar, please. All right. Well, Susan, um, you want to pop on to the next slide? Um, this is our official uh, time for questions. And I can't see the chat pod. Okay. Well, Mark oh, and I will relay any questions that come in there. Uh, and it looks like Tommy Bass has a question for you. So um, let me read it to you here. It says, with an increase in niche for small scale production, often by new producers, does anyone know of any organized management programs or curricula that mirror best management practices in management systems like BQA and PQA? Many of the small scale and niche, niche bleh, or whatever that word is, Producers are not in the information pipeline that conventional and traditional producers are. So the question is about our curricula available for them for disease control? Yes. Any organized management programs or curricula, curricula that mirror best management practices or BQA and PQA? So something's kind of scaled down for non-commercial. Non I'd, I'd have to investigate that, but nothing comes to mind right away uh, about curricula. Per, uh, probably some extension publications, but um, I'm not aware of curricula on that extent. We have a USDA grant where we're developing a curriculum on biosecurity for 4-H youth that's going to be online, and it has six modules uh, and it's suitable to, for anyone mm -hmm. uh, but it's de being developed for 4-H'ers okay. and that is in progress but as far as a self-contained curriculum I'm not aware of one yet but uh, Tommy I know you uh, have your email addresses so I will look that up when I have a chance here when we're done and send, send that to you if I find something now, I just want to make a, one tiny little comment about the picture of the horse in the back of the car. <laughs> yes. That was a great picture. My mother used to carry her sheep to the vet in the back of my car. But we only was, had sheep. Was, was it a Dodge Ram? 
<laughs> no, it was a Volkswagen 412. Does anybody know what those even look like? <laughs> well, I hope you didn't have to sit back there afterwards. Uh, no. <laughs> that car was on its way out. At that I saw... I saw the back seat of a police car once after they'd hauled a goat around, and that was unpleasant. <laughs> mm, I imagine. I imagine. Goodness. All right. Well, um, we have a minute or two more for um, any other questions. And Susan, we did have someone add to the chat pod a link for um, a resource that Thank I'm you. not familiar with. Thank you. I can't see that. <laughs> if you'll click, yeah, if you go up top and then I think you'll need to do more and then chat, I think it'll bring the window to the foreground. More. I, I think it's a little dot, dot, dot. There's a little yep. el ellipsis there and then there's chat maybe inside that. Oh, yay. Thanks. I'll go to that link. Yikes. Oh, is this in a Nebraska thing for quality insurance? Oh, okay. The Nebraska curriculum. I don't know to what extent that involves biosecurity. But certainly keeping animals healthy is a big component of youth quality care for animals. Thank you for explaining that acronym. I'm a little slow. <laughs> and we are almost out of time, Susan. So if you want to click on to the next slide. <laughs> well, now, of course, I'm all, there we go. Okay. Questions. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is where our archive will be posted um, as soon as we get that finalized. Um, and usually we have that within 24, 48 hours. So come back here in the next day or two. And if you'll notice up here, you can add this to your calendar. So if you go on and add it, excuse me, not add to the calendar, but follow this event, you'll be notified as soon as that archive is uploaded to the, to the slide. Next slide. If you click on follow this event, you're saying. All right, that's okay. great, thank you. Okay. All right, and so just to remind everybody that, that Eden has several more resource spots available to them. Um, Eden.lsu.edu uh, is our main site, but we also have, next slide, resources on extension.org. So you can find a ton of stuff here. Um, just uh, follow the link that's listed there, and you can see things on agriculture, flooding, avian influenza, and many more things. Next slide. We are also all over social media. So if you are also in social media, please be sure to follow us. And I think that might be the last one. I do want to remind you that our last webinar for the season or for the year will be held on December the 13th. And you can add that to your calendar by going to the learn event found there. So we hope that you'll be able to join us at one o'clock Eastern time on December 13th to learn about flooding and farm evacuation. In the meantime, y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.